Hello to everyone who is and has been viewing The Great Reflection. I am Sally Ann Ranney, and I'm so honored and delighted to be a part of this gathering. The timing is impeccable for a pause in this dizzying race we seem to be in to extinct ourselves and, and take a lot of other species with us, pursuing wars that are absolutely pure madness and watching AI head into some very, very questionable directions. So it is time for a pause and a reflection, why we are where we are and how do we get to where we think we would like to be. I want to thank the organizers. This was a brilliant, brilliant idea. Uh, I am president and co-founder of Global Choices, an all-women-led uh, international organization with offices in Europe and the United States. And our vision is one consciousness in action to protect the Earth's global commons. And those are the interdependent natural systems that are critical, support all life on this planet. And actually, the global commons belong to all of us. Our specific mission is to drive action on the ice crisis and take this issue to the top of the global agenda. Because if we lose the poles and the Arctic sea ice, which is a shield from the sun's heat and radiation, the consequences are worldwide and deadly. And we're just now beginning to see uh, the, the results, experience the results of that, the consequences. We're laser focused on the Arctic sea ice because of that reason. And also because it is now melting so much, it is uh, retracting into the central Arctic Ocean. We have actually lost 54% of the reflection capacity in just the last few decades. So we've also proposed a pause predicated on the precautionary principle, a 10 year moratorium on activities harmful uh, to this fragile planetary cooling system and climate stabilizer. So as I've been reflecting in the past couple months uh, about where, where we are, and have reviewed, if you will, my last five decades working in many aspects of environmental policy, conservation of large landscapes, biodiversity, water, water resilience, renewable energy, and, and climate change across three continents. And working with three different presidents, I have to say, the truth is we have lost ground. And how can this be? when so many people are doing extraordinary work across the planet, something is fundamentally out of sync. Something is wrong. And so I came to the realization that we believe, and so thus we act as such, that we are separate from nature and separate from each other. But this is an illusion. Yet, it is running the dominant worldview. Species injustice and the Arctic meltdown are just two of the multitudes upon multitudes of symptoms of this, but both have unsuspecting implications for humanity's future. So let's, let's proceed. Things are not always as they appear. And when we look at Earth from a distance, it's this beautiful green and blue orb, some call it a marble in space, a gem. And it looks like everything is just perfect, just fine. Everything's in harmony, no problems. But that's not the case. What's happening at this moment is we are in a struggle between greed, and of course I've simplified a lot of factors and variables, to make this digestible, but we're in a struggle between greed and grace. If you remember a song by Bette Midler several years ago, um, it was called From a Distance, and um, some of the lyrics are, from a distance, we all have enough, and there's no one in need. There are no guns, no bombs, no disease, no hungry mouths to feed. From a distance, you look like my friend, even though we're at war. From a distance, I cannot comprehend what all the fighting is for. 
From a distance, there is harmony, and it echoes through the land. And this is, in fact, in the heart of every man. And I believe that. I don't believe that the majority of humanity is happy about the road that we're on, the trajectory that we've taken. So greed is, we're devouring the planet like there is no tomorrow and uh, trying to feed appetites that apparently have um, no end. And the hidden costs of that have been very significant. Uh, we only have 38% of our primal forest left. Uh, we have taken the waters, the very life of the planet. We've dammed them, polluted them. And now we have CO2 from fossil fuels and methane, which uh, is causing global warming, which is actually um, one of our among others, uh, existential risks. And grace is a different relationship. Uh, and I call it grace because it is gentle. It is kind. It is um, uh, a deeper communion with our fellow earth inhabitants, respectful, loving, to be trusted, uh, a relationship that is no harm. If there's hunting, it's a ritual of deep gratitude to another being giving its life to you for your well-being. And there cannot be waste, no abuse, no ego-charged victory in that relationship. This is the circle of life to be honored. And, and out of respect, or I think respect actually comes from being in awe of nature and the nature of genius, the genius of nature. And we must take care of each other. We must take care of nature and nature will take care of us. So this is the moment. And the reason it's the moment, we have arrived at an inflection point. This is critical because what happens in an inflection point is there's so much tension that um, it has to go one way or the other. And in this case, it's the old paradigm and hanging on to the status quo with a tight grip and hanging on for dear life, while at the same time, a new paradigm is arising, trying to arise. And the aspects and the qualities uh, between those two, these are two worldviews, are very different. And so there's a dissonance. And this dissonance is um, shows us that um, there is a struggle. And we're seeing that all over the planet with uh, conflicts and wars and, and um, civil, uh, civil disputes and it goes on and on, neighbor to neighbor. Um, it's in the media. It's on social media. Um, conflicts everywhere and polarization. The divide is getting wider and deeper. And the good news is, though, is that the injustices are being revealed in this dissidence. And um, and they, they, it can't, these injustices can't hide anymore. But there is something fundamentally not in sync. And so I wanna take a deeper inquiry and how I'm gonna do that is share a story with you, um, a, a personal story. But before I do that, you know, this, this conflict is uh, a struggle really for the supremacy of a dominant worldview. Profit over people and planet is the greed. Uh, people and planet over profit is grace. The quintessential question is, can humanity purposely evolve? So I want to share with you um, a story, uh, a personal story that I think uh, will help you in um, understanding where 
where this disconnect is. Uh, when I was young, about four or five, I asked my mother, where did we live? And instead of giving me our address or name of the town we lived in or uh, the street, she said, we live on this beautiful blue star. Although it's not really a blue star, it's a planet. But that description, that image ignited an excitement in me is that I wanted to learn everything about this place. And I imagined it to be huge and magical. She told me that there weren't very many blue stars in the universe. So I felt very privileged to be on this one. And then in school, I learned about the solar system. And I saw a picture of our celestial neighborhood, and I was stunned at how small and vulnerable the earth looked. In fact, I was devastated. But at the same time, something in me said, because of those two facts, the earth was more special than I ever could have imagined. About two years after that, uh, one day we were at a church and I was in Sunday school. And I remember it very vividly. All the children in Sunday school were in a semicircle with, and we all had our Bible books open. And the Sunday school teacher was standing and reading the story to us. And I all of a sudden got up, closed my Bible book and said, this is not the truth. I don't believe it. I don't want to be here anymore. And I'm not coming back. And I walked out and shut the door. Well, I knew they were going to get my mother out of the congregation, which they did. And I was trucking it home. I was petrified because I didn't realize what I had done until I had shut the door and, and I was out of the room. So I heard her call and she said, Sally, stop. And I said, I, I didn't stop. And then she said, Sally Ann, stop. And when your mother uses your middle name, you better pay attention. So I stopped, but I didn't turn around. And she came up to me very gently, put her hands on my shoulders, turned me around, and then stooped down so that she was talking to me eye to eye. She was, she was not talking down to me. And she said, I understand that you don't believe what you're being taught in Bible class and you never want to go back. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's right. And she said, well, if you don't want to be in Sunday school, where do you want to be? And I said, over there, I pointed over there. And this was a beautiful field across the street uh, from our house. And it had these big old trees and beautiful green grasses and a little brook and there were there were um sand there was sand by the brook where you could see the tracks of birds and frogs and ants and beetles and i could lie back and watch the clouds and see the birds and to me to me that was heaven and there was one old tree and it was a her i don't know how i knew that but i knew that and she had a cavity at her base that was just big enough for me to crawl in and take my naps. And so I started spending all the time I could after school with her and every single weekend. And I didn't care really what the weather was. And, and one day I heard a voice and it said, put your ear against my skin and hear me grow. Well, this voice was very firm and sounded non-negotiable, so I did it. And of course, I was seven years old, but I swear I heard the sound of the sap moving through the xylem of the tree. And a few months later, I heard that voice again, and it said, close your eyes, put your back straight against me and be still. Basically, that was meditation, but I knew nothing as a seven-year-old about meditation, but I followed the instructions. And in a few minutes, I felt an overwhelming presence around me that scared me at first, but then I realized it was a great benevolence, and I felt safe. And then I wanted to open my eyes to see what was going on, but I was afraid to because it was so wonderful, and I was afraid that it would go away. But I did. 
And what I saw is everything was like a Monet painting, dots of different colored light moving all around. No hard boundaries between me and the tree, me and the grass, me and the creek. It was all one in motion. And then some startling things uh, just arose. And one was the trees talked to each other. And the other one was, not in these words, but the major impulse of the universe is cooperation. Somehow, and I'm going, what? Really? But somehow it sounded right to me. I knew nothing of the survival of the fittest or the science of trees communicating. And of course, at the time uh, of Darwin, competition was a brilliant explanation of how things work. And Consequently, it became a deeply embedded assumption and belief in the human psyche. And upon a cursory observation, it certainly appears as competition. However, as research has mar marched on, survival of the fittest has become subject to question. That it might not always be the case. So bison and wolves, I have some experience with both. And it is actually in cooperation that the weak, the sick, the crippled get taken by the wolves. It benefits the bison and it benefits the wolves. It's interesting if, if the bison or elk, which is also on their menu, um, for example, are really strong and healthy and they don't leave calves behind, usually no one falls to the fangs that day. And trees talking to themselves, to each other? Well, actually, we know scientifically they do. They use a mycorrhizal fungi, which is an underground cooperative network to communicate. And it's a natural language. <clears throat> and, it, and it exists beyond our understanding because trees speak in frequencies that humans can't perceive. So... I started talking to nature, actually having a conversation because it spoke to me, not in words, but in concepts, in it unlocked knowings, something I already knew but had never experienced in this way. And I had to be still and listen, and not so much with my ears, but with my heart first and then my head. That's another thing. We've been taught that uh, the impression goes to the brain first and then the heart. And now it's scientifically proved that's not the case. Your heart takes the first impression and then it goes to your brain. Anyway, animals would come to me in these conversations, unafraid. And I started noticing patterns in everything. Um, and, and it was remarkable to me that, that everything in nature is purposeful. It has a place. It has a function. It has a mission. And cooperation was everywhere. And not just in beehives and, and anthills, but I would see hawks come together in twos to hunt because their chances of um, better results in cooperation was much much higher. And then precision, when you think about the speed at which and the eyes that are needed for an eagle to take a fish out of the water, or a fox that hears a mouse two feet under the snow, jumps up, boom, dives, and is right on target. And then being exposed to the dazzling array of biodiversity and species on this planet. It is heart boggling and it's mind boggling. And then I learned about evolution in school and I developed a great respect for the evolutionary process because it is really tricky business. I mean, look at this guy. But nature is slow, yet everything gets done. We are fast, we are impatient, and so we are out of sync. The other thing that 
became very evident to me is that everything is inextricably connected. And so I felt safe in knowing, in the knowings, and I loved it all. And then we learned again about, this was all, you know, when I was in school, uh, about the tree of life. And that we are not, we're not the pinnacle of creation. That's a misnomer, but some theologies have maintained that for centuries. And yes, we have characteristics and capabilities that are uniquely human, like a complex uh, symbolic language, self-awareness, death awareness, moral sensibilities, but we're not evolving now biologically. We're evolving by ideas and memes, which are collective consciousnesses, different ones. So the fact that we had this capacity doubles the onus on us to be particularly precautious in how we use them because we wield great forces. We are only one branch on the tree of life, but we're a heavyweight and we are breaking the other branches. And so how can we be separate? We're all made of the same stuff. We are born of this earth, the same elements, the same stuff as the birds, the squids, the trees, the beetles, the bees, the water, the sand. I am it and it is me. There's no separation. And consequently, anything that diminishes the creation diminishes me. So through these experiences, I began to awaken. Uh, in other words, my awareness was, was heightened to a significant degree. And I realized this is really how it is. This is how it works. We are all one. And possibly this is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. It's the manifest and the unmanifest. And consciousness is expressing itself as a human, a rabbit, a tree, a house, a horse. It's all possible because the university is abundant in possibilities. What a magnificent, intelligent design. And yet, here we are facing multiple existential risks. But I posit to you, it's not hate or mass genocide or nuclear war or climate change or even the evil use of AI. The greatest existential risk is that we think that we are, we believe that we are separate from all that is. And consequently, our actions in the world show, demonstrate that. And this can be traced back to false assumptions. Assumptions are the frameworks for beliefs and beliefs express our we express our values through our beliefs. And of course, then they're reflected in our action. So not only do we, the majority, we feel that we're separate from each other in nature, but that the universe is mechanical. And it's really fun to look at through a telescope, but we're not involved. We're just observers. We don't think we're involved. And we're taught we're not worthy of talking to God directly. God will strike you down if you don't follow the rules, which of course was human created for uh, control purposes in the first place. But when you believe you're not worthy, then you doubt everything and you're in fear. You doubt the creator and the creation and you live in fear. And we still live in a great deal of fur, uh, fear. We, we fear everything from the Russians to cat hair. It's, it's, it's unbelievable to carry all of that. And then competition, the only way maybe to get ahead, there was never enough to go around. So get yours first and get it fast. The bottom line, this is the bottom line. There can be no lasting peace or enduring sustainability with this world view dominant. And in this level of consciousness, it is simply impossible. And as Bucky Fuller said, 
He said, we are imprisoned by what we, in the dark ages, uh, by what we have been conditioned to think. And that conditioning is now our dominant worldview, which is not serving us or life on the planet. So what it's produced, uh, what it allows us, it gives us permission to do is, and we see it everywhere, is the have and the have nots. Well, I have a lot and I've worked hard and I'm sorry that you don't, but it's the way it is. And that, that gap is getting wider between the haves and the have nots. And we have dire, dire poverty around the world. Yes, people trying to um, fix that and uh, reduce poverty, but there really shouldn't be any. With the right distribution, the right attitudes uh, of sharing and that we're all connected, it doesn't have to be that way. And it begets violence against women, uh, suppression of women, and wars. Wars are senseless. Wars are out of date. We should be using diplomacy. Why are we not using diplomacy? Why can we not resolve with compromise? And pollution, it's allowed horrible pollution. And extinction, this is Lonesome George. He died when he was 102. He's a Pinta Island uh, tortoise. Uh, he lived in the Galapagos and his species mates were used as food by whalers. And then fishermen, when they'd see them, they would just butcher them for no reason. They didn't eat them. It was just fun to kill. And then Martha, probably the most famous of an extinct species. And there were, she's the last carrier pigeon. There were 3 billion that went to zero. And what we did to this species was so barbaric. Shoot thousands and thousands and thousands a day. Catch them in nets and shoot them in nets. Then they couldn't get away. Torch trees that then would kind of explode and uh, into their roosts and the scorched adults would fly away and the babies would fall on the ground and burst open and poison them and every other thing that that you can think of. It's 100 year anniversary since she died in 1914. And we're still doing it. This is a pregnant orangutan that has found the last tree with the last branch in her entire habitat. It has been clear cut and deforested for palm oil plantation. 80% of the orangutan habitat has been lost in the last 20 years. And this one is truly a bloodbath. This is called uh, a drive hunt. This is on the Faroe Islands, which is between Norway and Iceland in um, uh, the North Pacific, uh, the North Atlantic, I'm sorry. And what they do is they drive whales, primarily pilot whales, and dolphins, white-sided dolphins, they drive them into beaches so that they will beach themselves. And then people are waiting to kill them and butcher them. And last year, 1,428 white-sided dolphins were killed and 700 pilot whales. This happens under the guise of cultural tradition. The consciousness has not evolved. And we know that we're pushing polar bears to their last stand. So I am thoroughly convinced by all these examples and many, many, many more that the illusion of separation is actually the software that runs the dominant world. We need a new software. And what is that software? It's our consciousness, the level of our consciousness. So if you asked most people, what do these three have in common? People, elephants, and polar bears. They'd say, well, the air, the water, yes. But unsuspectingly, it is actually the Arctic meltdown 
because what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And when I tell people that elephants are ice dependent species, they actually start some critical thinking, which is good. So let me put this in a context here. Um, the cryosphere, as I mentioned before, is uh, one of the five Earth systems that supports life. And it's all the ice and snow and frozen area on the planet. In the 2000s, the top image, that's what we had. These are all based on satellite imagery. And currently, look at what it is, particularly in the north what we have lost in a very short period of time. So this gives you an idea, again, from satellites, exactly what this happens. It only goes to 2020. 2023 uh, is much less ice cover than shown here. We've lost 13% of um, ice in uh, the last, per decade, uh, in the last few decades. And a recent study has said, well, that's enough ice actually for a hundred feet of ice sheet on uh, uh, England. And a recent, not so recent now, a study predicted that we would be ice free in the Arctic by 2050. Well, that has been moved up to 2035. You realize that's only 11 years away, 11 years. So herein is the problem. A ton of emitted CO2 equals three meters squared or 32 feet squared of Arctic sea ice lost. This is scientifically validated. And so wh what does this mean in, um, in real tangible terms? Well, this is so interesting. It's 138 meat-based meals compared to 1,961 vegetarian meals. It's a one-way ticket by one passenger uh, by a commercial flight New York to Paris or 3,000 mile round trip Boston uh, to London. And here's the one that is real that we can really do something about. One SUV filling up ga with gas 46 times or 2,000 miles driven uh, in a gasoline powered car. So the average of the CO2 emitted uh, in America is 16 tons. So it'd be 16 of those balls that you see there. In Europe, 27 countries, it's eight tons. And in the rest of the world, the average is 4.7. But guitar, guitar is 37.5 um, tons per person of CO2. And so here's the result. Uh, the temperature projections in the Arctic to 2021. And this is if we do not, I'm sorry there, this is if we do not uh, accelerate our emission reductions by 10 times what we're doing now. And why does this matter? Because when one system goes down, the cryosphere, it affects everything else, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the geosphere, because everything's connected to everything. So you have um, a Gulf Stream, which is slowing down, a disruption of food chains, a, an, an oxygen production, which most people are not really focused on, but it is a real thing, and, and sea level rise, which of course everyone is aware of, and, and also, atmospheric rivers that um, we've always had, but now because the heat is trapping moisture, we're getting 20 inches of rain in four hours, which we've never seen before. And of course, permafrost is exacerbated, which is emitting uh, methanes and the jet stream because of the loss of the sea ice shield is now wobbly. And this is why we have Texas freezing when the polar vortex goes south. And we have heat domes when hot air, warm air comes up from the equator, hits the polar vortex and gets stalled. And so we have heat domes. This is what it looked like before. 
And here is what's going on with ocean currents. Uh, the composition of the water column is changing. And so as more fresh water comes in, it's lighter and therefore uh, it, it sinks less. So, so it slows things down. And this is why the Gulf Stream is weakening. Um, and and um, however, these, these winds uh, that are perpetrated, uh, you saw that on the slide before, uh, are, are remaining the same. And this is also happening, as you can see, um, it goes, it's the ocean conveyor belt. So it's affecting uh, also the Southern oscillations. Also, more frequent and violent storms are scientifically linked, again, to the Arctic sea ice. And uh, this picture uh, on the bottom is actually Phoenix, Arizona, and this is very unusual. This is a huge dust storm, sandstorm, with a thunderstorm. And of course, in Asia uh, and in China, horrible droughts for a couple of years and lost billions in food crops. And I put in these pictures of the West because... Um, <laughs> people don't believe, a lot of people don't believe that um, the trend in the West is less moisture and they're irrigating like water was, the water is never going away. The Colorado River has 30% less flow uh, than, it, than it had 20 years ago. And then the droughts in East Africa um, also linked uh, to Arctic sea ice because they suspect that um, this is fiddling with, disrupting El Nino and La Nina. So elephants were dropping dead, giraffes, all kinds of wildlife, uh, no water, no forage, and livestock and people starving. Very serious, serious situation. And of course, attendant to that is wildfires. Last year, there were 4.5 million wildfires in the world. And then floods because of the heat trapping of moisture, like we've never seen before. On the left is Pakistan, $50 billion in estimated damage. And on the right is um, Italy. And of course, what it's doing with um, to local people, the Inuit who um, uh, hunt on the ice, everything now is unpredictable. The ice is thin um, at different times of the year. Everything has changed as far as their hunting goes. And that has also changed the oral history, passing down to the youth, because it's not like it used to be. The Sami um, are having difficulties with their reindeer herds because uh, the tundra is icing over uh, and very thick, hard ice. And the reindeer have trouble pawing through that and getting to their forage. Um, some colleagues of mine who have done research in the Arctic told me, and it just broke my heart, they saw a polar bear eating kelp. You know what that means. So this is a global SOS. It might be the global SOS. Um, and so we've been raising the alarm, my organization. If you look at this, this graphic, the B up here is the Arctic. And every arrow that goes to every other, to every tipping point emanates, comes out of the loss of sea ice, the loss of the Arctic. And so the consequences of this are global. There's a global reach. I don't care where you live. And there's a good possibility we lose, we let the ice go, we're complicit, and we let that go. It will trigger a cascade of, of these catastrophic climate tipping points, and scientists think they might possibly go in a domino effect. So you would think, would you not, that this is so vital, so vital to the planet and to humanity and other species that we would treat it with kid gloves. We would do anything to make sure that it was okay. 
but that's not happening. So hovering are companies and countries to take advantage of the melt, a huge catastrophic climate event. For deep sea bed mining, oil and gas, exploration, seismic testing goes, blasting goes with that, a transpolar shipping route that goes across the North Pole, mass tourism, uh, radioactive waste dumping, and of course there's military buildup, and there's heavy fuel oil still being used by ships until 2029. It's, it's been pushed off a couple times, the deadline, and black carbon is coming from that and also from Europe. And uh, that makes the ice dark and absorbs more heat and it melts faster. So the stakes were so high that civil society and scientists stepped up to the plate. And Global Choices, my organization, is leading this effort. Um, we've proposed, as I said in the beginning, a pause, a 10-year moratorium to protect um, the ice shield in the central Arctic Ocean. As you can see that the ice shield now retreats, it melts back into uh, the central Arctic Ocean. And that's a high seas global commons under the sea of um, the uh, UN uh, law of the sea. So it belongs to everybody. It is for the benefit of mankind. It does not involve any of the EEZ zones, the 200 mile uh, limit. Um, so, so we are uh, pursuing and have countries now that are interested in, in endorsing this. And this is the first step to um, hopefully a potential treaty. So what's happening is that the sea ice melt is literally cracking the illusion of separation because we're all connected. But unfortunately, and we're all being impacted. Unfortunately, most of the global leaders are operating in the old paradigm. So we're not going 10 times faster on emissions. And this is, they don't understand that we are all ice dependent species. It's not just polar bears or seals. So we have this battle of values and worldviews. And I don't need to tell you which is which in this image. But here's the good news. Every problem emerges from the false belief we are separate from one another, and every answer emerges from the realization that we are not. And so this realization brings us right to the edge, right to the edge of the great turning, which is about changing the level of consciousness. And so Albert Einstein said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. We all know that one. And Buckminster Fuller said, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality or paradigm. You have to build a new model that makes the existing model or paradigm obsolete. So where do we go first? to start this process. Well, I believe with Albert, as Albert Einstein, I, I'm with him 150%, go deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. So the universe is not a mechanical out there presence or operative. It is inside of us. There is a master intelligent design going on in the universe. Here's a brain cell and here's the universe. The structures are very similar. There are many things. This is just one picture. There are many things in the human body that are very similar to structural design in the universe. And the same with the human body. Of course, this is da Vinci and flowers and uh, the list of similarities goes on and on. This is intelligent design. I heard somebody ask, <laughs> was the creator a mathematician? <laughs> because uh, it, is, it is beyond remarkable. So when we look into nature, we have to look nature in the eyes, straight in the eyes. This is an invitation. And who do you see? You see you. And this is an invitation to re 
member yourself as nature, what you really are. And, and I've learned from this, never turn your back on your true nature. And also, I love what Rumi said, stop acting so small. You are the universe in motion. So we have to also redefine our relationship with other beings on the planet and surrender to, not just tolerate, surrender to the arising of the feminine energy to balance what was all male energy for so long. We have to surrender to it, embrace it. And we have to learn from those who know. Most, if not all, Native peoples around the world called Earth Mother because they recognize that she is alive. She nourishes us and she is sacred. And they were always close to her. And think about it. We came from her and we go, we return to her. And so this spiritual concept is as ancient as indigenous colors. The Celts and the Druids saw the earth as their mother. And also, because it's alive, it's conscious. And her vital organs, so her tr the trees, the giant primeval forests are her lungs. The wetlands are her liver, the waters, her blood, the winds are her breath, and the sacred seasons are her heartbeat. Native people have always known this, and this is why their ancestors are so important, because they respected and cared for her for countless tens of thousands of years. And that's why they have survived so long. And they fight to this day to protect her from harm. So we must listen to them. Learn, but apply what we learn from indigenous peoples. This is a photograph of the Kogi who live in Northern Colombia and have for a thousand years. Uh, five, the last 500 is um, they, they fled to the mountains when the Carib uh, invaded. And they are ancestors of Aztecs, uh, the Aztecs and the Inca. There's about 20,000 of them uh, in several different villages. And they call us little brother because we know so much less. And their, their spiritual practice is called a luna, which means conscience or consciousness. This next image is a uh, Siberian is a Siberian shaman who is performing a ceremony of gratitude and thanks giving uh, to Bacall Lake, which is the largest freshwater body on the planet. And they call her the blue eye. And she has given them all their food, the fish, water, and life. And now uh, Lake Bacall is uh, polluted from many sources. I can't go into it all. But affluence, um, nanoplastics, and also uh, as a destination point for ecotourists, one million people a year. And I remember reading about the Plains Indians and their relationship to the, to the bison. And I came across a statement by a Pawnee chief when he saw the settlers turning the soil uh, plowing the soil, and he said, grass, no good, upside down. And was he ever right? And between the time that Europeans invaded the West, the bison went from 30 million to 200. Our plains had the highest protein of any any place on earth when the bison when the bison existed per square foot more pr protein than any place else and then i can't leave um indigenous wisdom without talking about wallace black elk um he was a shaman and a medicine man he's passed 
um, that I, a Lakota, uh, that I was very fortunate to spend time with and learn from and um, and do uh, some sweats with him. And he spoke from what they call a universal mind. He did not have schooling the way we have schooling. His education was uh, being taught by 11 grandfathers. And, and he says the same, the same things, uh, that we doubt the creator. Uh, it has separated us from the creator and it's created the reality we experience and understanding the true nature of rock, fire, water, and green is required now to stop what is out of control. And he says that we have abused the wisdom, the knowledge, the power the creator gave us. And now we are suffering and we have to put the fire back where it belongs and also the water, the rock and the green. We can regain what we lost but there is no distance between, there is no distance between us, the rock, the water, the green, and the fire, or the stars and the animals. No separation. So can we do this? Can we move into a totally different mindset, heart set? a different level of consciousness. I think we can. So do you remember Apollo 8 and the first photograph that um, that was sent back uh, for, uh, uh, by them and it was the earth rise and it changed humanity's perception. We're just this tiny little marble in a huge, a gigantic universe with finite everything. Bucky Fuller called it Spaceship Earth with limited life support on board to support its crew, which is all of us and all of life on Earth. There are limits, planetary boundaries, and we're right on the edge of exceeding several at great peril to us and all our relations, which are all life on the planet. So how do we shift? We create a new model. And that model has a different set of aspects. But the old dominant worldview is like a tar baby. And it's extremely difficult to pull away from it. Because when you try, there's always a part of you that's that's stuck there and you and you get sucked back. And Part of that is because we've structured ourselves around political, economic, and cultural systems in a way that hooks us, keeps us in the old paradigm. But it can be done, and it actually must be done. So the new model, abundance, knowing that abundance is the infinite state of possibilities, which is the nature of the universe, and love is the fundamental uniting force. Of the, of the universe. And I will tell you about um, its frequency in just a moment. Trust is freedom. Trust yourself, trust your intuition, trust your greater knowing, trust the process of life, trust the creation and the creator. Collaboration. We are stronger together. Competition often seems as the only way to success, but think of the wolves in the pack, the bees in the hive, Nature has solutions in her designs and processes. For example, there's no waste. One organism's waste is another's food. Create the reality by the power of our consciousness and our thoughts. We created the old paradigm. We can create the new one. We know now in quantum physics that the observer changes the observed. So what do you choose to observe? Where do you put your attention? What assumptions do you hold? And what is the narrative that goes with that? All creation is one, the all that is, the manifest and the unmanifest. Nothing exists in isolation. The internet and AI make it appear that it's so, but that's not how it works. And we are indeed one humanity. And humanity is on an upward spiral. 
in our consciousness. It appears that we're not because we're in birthing pains in that inflection uh, point, the graph I showed earlier, but, and this is the time of discontent, confusion, and struggles uh, for balance, etc. but we are on an upward spiral. So holding on to the old is a contracting process. And trying to manifest the new under that weight and fear of change is extremely difficult. So we have to use our free will. Now, what is that really? It's self-determination. It's the power, the ability to act at one's own discretion. So we have a choice in how we act. We are free to choose our behavior. And our frequency of our consciousness. And everything is energy and frequencies. And I have come very recently to regard understanding frequency and vibration as an absolute essential for the new paradigm, um, for a new dominant world view. So I wanna share a couple facts with you. Um, it is scientifically proven that fear has a lower frequency than love. And according to recent studies, our brains learn and experience fear at a certain brain wave frequency. And that happens to be four cycles per second or four hertz. And so what you feel, what you express, what you perceive, how you act comes out of that frequency. Love has been scientifically proven to carry a unique frequency of 528 hertz. And that's also known as, as the miracle frequency because it's the same frequency um, that they use for DNA repairs. Trust also has a 528 hertz. And the higher frequencies bring connection, surrender, alignment, and expansion of vision. And you also have more energy. Enlightenment, you'll be interested to know, has a hertz of 700. So we are at a point now where we need to go from a transactional dominant worldview to a transformational dominant worldview. And to get there from here, there are there's an alchemy of aspects. And uh, I'm going to go um, uh, into some of these with a little detail. Trust is trusting in yourself, trusting in the process of life, your intuition, which is your true North guidance system, by the way. And trust is also consistency, compassion, communication, and competency. Love is the unifying force of the universe. And universal love is unique in that it doesn't have a subject like a child, a friend. Uh, it is rather directed to the all of existence. And so um, it's kind of an optical illusion of consciousness, if you will, that we don't understand that. And so, so we're, we're imprisoned. But those of us who strive to break through that delusion, we're actually on the way to liberation and higher consciousness. Integrity is incorruptibility. Vision and imagination. So remote seeing, remote sensing, a 360 degrees heightened awareness um, and imagination coming out of that place um, that I mentioned before where you're in the child's uh, excitement and uh, without the overburden. You're in a child's um, mind and being without the overburden of all our education, cultural systems, etc., belief, belief systems. And hold a quiet no mind because this lets us listen objectively and it allows inspiration to spring from source and it keeps the channels clear and clean for your intuition. And heart to heart, we have to be authentic. We cannot be deceptive in the new paradigm. We meet people where they are with dignity, respect, and friendliness. 
And also we need to evolve our egos. This is not about leaving the ego at the door. Uh, this is understanding that an evolved ego serves the soul. The unevolved ego serves itself. And we know where that's gotten us. Humility is without pretense, without superiority. It is understanding that uh, we all are works in process. The vibrancy of, of curiosity high, with heightened awareness is really an unbeatable combination for creativity. And discernment, discernment, I have come to believe is, a, is now a survival skill because there's so much illusion, the internet, media, fake news, the, it goes on and on and on, these bots that aren't even real, that have 2 million followers on, on social media. I mean, <laughs> so I think it is now a survival skill. Uh, and along with keeping our immune systems in, in top performance, perseverance is priceless. Uh, it makes the difference often between success and failure. And as Ted Turner says, winners never quit and quitters never win. Resilience is actually bringing all these aspects together. Uh, the ability to successfully adapt to very difficult or challenging situations, which this is in this inflection point, this is where we are, and have the mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility along with awareness, problem-solving skills, and being open, open, and having a very low level of neuroticism. Whole systems. Uh, this is interesting because we have been trained to think more in geometric forms, in pieces and parts, square city blocks, square buildings. Indigenous think holistic. Uh, so many, the Hogans, the Samburu in Africa, the, so many indigenous, their, their uh, vision was whole and many of their structures were round. So they see the whole as greater than the sum of its parts because they've been taught by nature, by living close to nature. So there's no question, this is a passage. Uh, this requires some practice and some resolve, giving yourself permission to move into higher frequencies of consciousness so we can correct the abuses of our power. And I want to say that um, I wrote the, the forward to this book, The Trust Frequency, 10 Assumptions for a New Paradigm. And um, I encourage everyone everyone to read this because it's a visionary uplifting synthesis of quantum science, Eastern mysticism, uh, indigenous uh, wisdom, and just good old plain common sense. So I think that, you know, and it does represent many, many years of research, observation, and personal experience. And in this book, they distill you know, how you could uh, create a new paradigm with their seven A's. And I'm going to share these here. Assumptions, unpack and unravel your existing assumptions. Deeply examine if they are serving a loving, nurturing, flourishing, just and equitable reality. This is the first step. This is a critical analysis for creating a new model and awareness. Awareness is self-aware, universe aware, responsibility aware. Yes, mindless, my, mindfulness, uh, inclusivity, uh, awake in the moment, knowing that the moment is really the only thing we have. The past is gone, the future's not here, in the moment. Attitude, attitude. It always seems impossible until it's done. Nelson Mandela, I have lived by that a lot of my life. And this attitude reflected his awareness um, and his consciousness in his actions. Attention. Where do you put your attention? Monitor your attention carefully. The unmanifest becomes manifest depending on where you locate and how long that attention is held. 
So it can determine what arises and what is created or not. So being on purpose is really important. Alignment, what does that mean? Align with our higher self. This does not allow greed or selfishness or competition at the expense of others. Align with your heart intelligence, with the feminine balance that's unfolding. Align with the genius of nature. Never lose the awe of nature. That is that brilliant, playful, curious child inside of us. Allow. Allowing is making room for possibility. And we have to allow enough room for new things to emerge. And tolerate is, is somewhat confused sometimes with allow, but tolerate is letting something be, but it, it comes with judgment and usually there's negativity attached. So when all of this comes together in action, we are in league with great benevolent forces. And so the action is well considered. It's on point. It's anchored. And this can take some time to come about or it can happen in a moment. And know where and how you land in the action. As Ted Turner says, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Very practical advice. So where we are is we are now the ancestors of all life on this planet. Look into the eyes of a mouse, an elephant, a dog, a child, a whale that might breach next to your boat, a honeybee, and see your own reflection. And we are the ancestors for all species, including our own. And in closing, I want to tell you a story um, that was shared with me by an Inuit elder who lives in the northern part of Greenland. Uh, when he was a young man, his mother, uh, and they knew that the Arctic was melting, and his um, mother uh, said to him, nothing needs to melt except the hearts of men. So maybe everything... I have just said would be effortless if we would just melt our hearts. But the choice is ours. And we're going to have to make a choice very soon because we are at the inflect, in the inflection point. And the time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you.